leave it up long at all. Just William King or you want Bill? William's fine. Okay. Well, hello and welcome to the Photo Brigade podcast. I'm Robert Kaplan. Today I have William King with me. How you doing, Mr. King? Just great, Robert. Well, it is uh, also you just turned 70, you just told me. I just wanted to wish you a happy birthday, and I'm so sorry to have made you go through all your photos yesterday on your birthday for this podcast. But okay. I had a good day. I had a productive day. Well, that's good. It's great, great to have you here. Um, before we get started, I just want to say thank you to Adorama to letting us use their ad, for letting us use their ad, uh, event space, as always. We've got a fly running around in here. Um, and also to uh, Canon Professional Services, uh, Tenba Bags, you guys rock for all your support. Thank you so much. Um, if you have any questions, uh, whether you're watching us on Facebook or Adorama TV YouTube, leave us comments, just uh, you know, actual comments. Uh, we'll come back and answer those um, afterwards if we don't get to them here in the podcast right now. So with no further ado, um, uh, William, um, so you, you and I met what probably at one of these events you, you started you came to one of these podcasts or one of our panels that we have regularly here mm -hmm. at adorama and uh we we started to to get to know each other and and i've been going through your work and you have quite an extensive career um shooting everything from photo early in your early days photojournalism you worked for yes. what paper was it well it was a paper in annapolis maryland <clears throat> Does it so long ago, I don't remember the name of the paper. <laughs> it probably no longer exists, yeah. It probably doesn't exist. Yeah. Um, right. Yeah. And, uh, and, and you've since uh, transitioned a bunch of different times, not only um, in career type from, you know, documentary photography, which you still do, but you, you got into commercial advertising, right. you were shooting book covers, and um, you got into in the 80s you got into was 80s or 90s you got into production doing production and stills so behind the scenes production stills for commercials here in new york city right shooting film back then because it was right. the 90s um and then also the transition into digital because now you're a, a, also a digital artist because uh, you you do a lot of, of uh, obviously digital photography and manipulation on the back end um, and then, we're, I know this is a lot, we're gonna get into it, but then you got into early childhood education, you started doing that. Um, that was in between analog and digital. Between analog and digital, you said, you know what, I'm just gonna let this play itself out and come back later, right? Uh, sure my, it was a good thing. It was a good thing, great. Um, and then back to photography, where you got your master's degree at, at, here in New York at SVA uh, a few years back. Right. And now we're just you know doing your thing, freelancing, being a photographer, and. Creating. Creating, which is important. So, And exhibiting. And exhibiting. Absolutely. So what I want to do is you gave me this great PowerPoint, which kind of goes through your, your career. Um, talk to me a little bit about your earlier days and your documentary days and as we go through and how this, these transitions transpired. Okay. Well, my, I first became interested in photography because I was a newspaper boy delivering the Washington Post. Oh, really? In high school. And these first two images, Mr. Brown and Leroy, were shot down in Marlboro, Maryland. They were, Mr. Brown and Leroy were stripping tobacco in a tobacco barn. This was actually the first roll of film I had ever shot. Wow. It was on a Nikon FTN with an 85 millimeter lens. Mm -hmm. And I processed the film. I've always processed my own black and white uh, and made the prints. Uh, Do you still shoot black and white and process? These days? I still have my dark room, but I have completely flipped yeah. to digital. I was working for the newspaper. I had an I covered the newspaper I worked for was in Annapolis. My beat was Laurel, Maryland, and Bowie, Maryland, and I was assigned to go down and photograph the governor, Governor Agnew's daughter in uh, Bowie, Maryland, one day, and uh, I photographed her for the paper. But then. I spotted this, this, the train engineer. It was a hundred year old this train, guy a here. steam yeah. engine, and I just couldn't leave without asking him, "May I please make a portrait of you?" Mm -hmm. And he said, "Just climb on right up here." And I was hanging off with one hand and camera in the other hand. I shot one frame. That was it. That was it. Nailed that's all it. I needed. You see, and that's one of the interesting things thinking back to the film days where you kind of had to be decisive you know you you had your your roll of film yeah maybe you had 24 36 images but you weren't just firing them off like 
we do now nowadays with our digital cameras. No. And no. Did, did you know you had the shot and you yeah. just moved on? Absolutely. It's like, that's that. I knew I had a shot. <laughs> nice. <laughs> nice. And then you got some amazing historic Well, this photos. was another assignment I was on for the paper. It was the first Mid-Atlantic ch Special ch Children's Olympics in the United States, and it was opened by Teddy Kennedy. Mm-hmm. I had I was assigned to photograph all the kids, and I did that. And this it was a, after I was finished. Mr. Kennedy started to politicking. All the execs from the University of Maryland Cole Fieldhouse wanted to meet him, and I just happened to be there. I was the only photographer there, and I grabbed. I was able to grab this shot. And you were just a youngster back then. Yeah, I was a youngster. Yeah, <laughs> really was. <laughs> Not anymore. <laughs> and this this photo I called. Guess the title of this. Um, the photo brigade. No, oh, the photo brigade. That's really? the title. Absolutely. Oh, well, look man. at those guys. <laughs> the, the, you're yeah. looking at the Washington Post. The, the, wa the I think it was the Washington Times, uh, uh -huh. Washington Star, and other mag uh, newspapers and magazines and agencies. They were uh, all the. Uh, Local churches in Washington were commemorating a site for a Vietnam memorial, mm -hmm. and it was a big deal. And Billy Graham was there. I was really lucky. I got, I was right next to Billy Graham, and I didn't have a press pass. I just wormed my way in there. So you were here in D.C. for this? Yeah, it's Washington D.C. And 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 but you were shooting for. My, you, that was me. Just you. You do. That it, was, you just doing your thing. I was doing showing my up thing. with yes. a camera. Yeah. I photographed Billy Graham's. Uh, they had a big. He had a big spiritual revival here in Queens, I, I guess maybe a decade ago when I was interning here in the city. Um, that was quite an experience. He was a much older man when I, when I photographed him though. This picture is a really special picture. Uh, after Martin Luther King was assassinated, Credit Scott King went from city to city in the United States having peace marches. In this picture, you, on the far right, you see Walter Fontroy, the mayor of Washington, D.C., Coretta Scott King in the center, and Stoney Cooks on the left. He used to work with Martin Luther King. He's from Alabama. Mm -hmm. Now, Coretta Scott King was at the Washington Monument. There were about 100,000 people there. I heard she was going to be in town, and uh, what I had gone through in high school it was crazy. I had to get a picture of her. I didn't have a press pass. I couldn't get near the monument, but I used to play in the museums with my twin brother Tom and the Smithsonian, so I knew the streets of Washington. And I selected a street that connected the, white, uh, the monument to the White House. It was a straight line. Mm -hmm. I stood in the middle of that street. There wasn't anybody on that street but a cop mm -hmm. and waited. And it was a gamble, but she walked right down that street. And I was wow. standing. The only illumination on that street were this the street lights uh -huh. and the candle lights. So it's available light shot, shot with a Nikon FTN, 85 millimeter lens. I mean, it looks like it was lit. Like Ilford was FP4, oh, rated wow. at 320, processed in AccuFine. <laughs> Old that, school. This picture uh, has been exhibited only a few times. It won an award at BAM for an, uh, in an exhibit honoring Martin Luther King. Uh -huh. Liz Elizabeth Avedon published it in an in, a in book. Uh, exhibit uh, in in Detroit, and uh, it won the jury's award out at uh, in an exhibit last year at the A. Smith Gallery. Wow, still winning awards! And all now these it's years on later. exhibit today uh, over at the Rockefeller Center uh, for Freedoms at the. It's it's being sponsored by the Four Freedom Rockefeller Center for Freedoms Conservatory, uh -huh. and. Uh, the United Photo Industries exhibit at the Riva, R-I-V-A-A -A gallery and on Roosevelt Island. Oh, very cool. Yeah, United Photo Industries uh, does the uh, Photoville and, and all these amazing events. We had Laura on the podcast talking about all that as well. Um, so you kind of transitioned a bit, right? This yeah. is a transition I, time for you. I came to New York in 72. I worked in a for a photographer in Carnegie Hall. And and I oh, speaking of that, real quick, the Carnegie Hall statement you just made. So back in the day, all the artists, all these artists used to work in the 
top level, right, of, of Carnegie Hall. Like, like Bill Cunningham used to live there, was it? Or, or do you know Bill Cunningham is a former New York Times photographer who well, passed away? I knew him when he was younger. Yeah, When yeah. I was younger, I ran into him quite a bit. He was a wonderful person. But I guess it was maybe like a decade ago or so they, yeah. they finally kicked everybody out and made him into fancy. Pete Turner's studio was there. Oh, yeah? Yeah. Wow. So anyways, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but that's just an interesting bit of history here in New York, that Carnegie Hall had all these It was a wonderful place to be in uh-huh. back in the day. I bet. I bet. Uh, so I didn't have a studio, and a, a, stu- a school chum of mine uh, from Art Center College of Design, where I went to study advertising photography in L.A., uh, Richard Schaefer, we opened a uh, Schaefer King studio. We were on 27th Street up the block from FIT. Mm-hmm. And we, we were struggling to get off the ground, and we ran into Art Kane. Mm-hmm. Art Kane was, became the creative director for Viva Magazine, and he gave us the break. He gave us a 19-page layout, our, our first job, and uh, it took us weeks to produce. But the image you're looking at is not a sepia tone photograph print and it's but it's hand painted it's a graphic art print Mm -hmm. which means we used uh codolith ab developer to to process our prints on kodak matte paper oh wow we used a harrison and harrison fog filter to filter the light we used strobes we lit uh, rust gay's restaurant with strobes we would end up with a, a negative that you couldn't see through. Mm. But when it was developed in, and we used a multi-graded paper that was a matte-based paper, but when it was processed using the Codalith, over after a two-minute period of time, it rendered these beautiful, beautiful, rich tones wow. and CP hues. Wow. This was uh, for Bill Wyman's first album cover. We did an ad for... Um, Atlantic Records, it was in Rolling Stone. Basil Powell was the art director. We didn't do the hand coloring, uh, Basil did. So you were, these, these? This was Johnny Winters flying over Texas as a butterfly, it was shot for High Times Magazine. Oh. We were asked to do a, a story uh, illustration of Johnny Winters, so we went to Johnny's house, sat with him for about an hour and talked to him, and we came out of the interview with. Johnny Winters flying over Texas as a (laughs) butterfly. This is a collage that was made. Took three artists to make it. Uh huh. And and so, was the majority of what you did in the studio this type of work where you where you did this heavy processing? I mean, this is like, not not hands on. Hands on. Sometimes it took a week to make a series of images because of the amount of labor involved. Uh huh. And we didn't farm it out. We did it all ourselves because we were trained to. Uh huh. And it was m- the majority of the work that you were doing at this period of time was was what what sort of uh, was was uh, album covers and book covers and such. Uh, no, at this time we were doing work for Mary Quant. We were doing primarily magazine work for uh, uh, Arcane. This the last two images you looked at uh-huh. are mine. Uh, they're not part of the Schaefer King. I started doing um, branching out on my own in '75. This was part of a window display designed for Julie's Artisans Gallery on Madison Avenue. Mm-hmm. The model is Hiram Keller. He had the co-star lead in Fellini's Satyricon. And I selected the brooch that he has around his neck, the legs, and the rest of the outfit was designed by a lady that made these really beautiful exotic color uh, feathered blouses. Mm-hmm. This was a shot that I did when I was a student at Art Center College of Design. It's shot with a F- Harrison Harrison fog filter. It's available light, processed with the Codalith developer on matte paper, and then I hand painted it. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then this turned into a novel cover. Yep. Very and it cool. also won an award from Art Direction Magazine. Mm-hmm. By the way, Seth, if you happen to see any questions over there, feel free to like, text them over to me. Or or oh, people just saying where they're from. Gotcha. <laughs> I saw some notes popping up on the YouTube comments. Again, Anybody, anybody watching on YouTube or watching on Facebook, feel free to ask any questions about process um, or William's uh, long career. So cool. Uh, it was so getting a book cover is that's a pretty cool, a pretty cool thing to get. Do you remember? Was that your first one? Do you remember what it was? No, I uh, after I stopped working for I left Peter Vaith. I used to work for him as an assistant for uh, a couple of years when he was in Carnegie Hall. 
Barbara Batoli was a creative director, the head art director over at Avon Books, and she wanted to, me to produce album, co album co book covers for uh -huh. her. So she took me uh, under her wing and tr taught me how to design book jackets. Mm -hmm. So it took me a month under t her teaching me to produce a book jacket. I read the manuscripts. I see. Well, that's uh, well, that's good. Okay, yeah. it's a long, involved process. And this 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 right here kind of shows your process here of how you. Uh, this was the retouching the hand part of the hand painting that we would do, that I would do. It uh, it's old school. It's analog based, and it, you have to have a lot of patience. You have to know where you're going with it. Mm -hmm. And uh, this was in How magazine. Very cool. Yeah, that's a lot of work. I mean, you. I mean, you actually did put put the makeup on on, yeah. these, on these models. I learned a lot from makeup artists, I must say. Oh yeah, so you absolutely. have. I'm sure you have a lot of respect for great, makeup uh, artists. Absolutely. So on. That's great. This was the cover of Art Direction magazine. Uh, I really miss that magazine. I wish there was something equivalent to it today, but I don't know if there is. I don't know much about Art Direction magazine. Art Direction magazine used to keep the pause up there keep track of the pulse of the industry, the photographic industry and advertising industry uh -huh. in New York I and see. in the United States. All different aspects of publishing. But they asked me to design a cover for my definition of advertising and this is what I came up with. Was gotcha. And it has to do with the stock market. Oh, okay. <laughs> of course, and re a good rep. <laughs> nice. Uh, then, then we have some more book covers. Yep, this is a still life. This is a hand-painted graphic art print that's shot in a studio. Mm -hmm. This is a location uh, in the city of New York. Craig DeCamps did the type on the last two. I used, If I was lucky, I got to work with Craig. Craig actually hand-designed the types. He's such a talented f type designer. You can see this is not, this is computer type. See. This was from Rev Ran uh, Random House, uh, Bluebell, Andrew Vosh. I got to do, I love doing murder mysteries. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, did you do any? Uh, any Lots of, of murder mysteries. <laughs> I love reading the murder mysteries. They were <laughs> that, great. Those are my favorite books, too. You know, missed anything with mysteries and, and uh, I, I, the, 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 the. This was an interesting job to shoot, though. I, I photographed each uh, model separately. One, uh, they were both actors, actually. Then I did a, uh, the still life of the phone, made the prints. I wasn't happy with the intensity of blue. I painted the phone red. The red was okay, but I wasn't happy with the blue. So I went down to Joe Portigallo's and Eric Talman's lab that when, when it was on um, Broadway, mm -hmm. south of Houston, and he let me use the copy camera, and I put the artwork in there, and I threw a blue gel over the top of it and before I, but underneath the phone. Mm -hmm. And it intensified the blue. It gave it that luminosity mm -hmm. that I was looking that for. That nice contrast. And produced an 8x10 chrome, which I gave the client. Cool. Charlie Mingus. That was a job. That job took me a week in the dark room to produce. It was a lot of work. Uh, it was a CBS before it became Sony, right at the turn. And uh, they said, we want you to design this cover. I said, give me, the, give me some music. I got to listen to music. So I, I spent a day in a dark room just listening to his music. And I had made uh, conversion negatives from a chrome his wife had shot in, his, in a rehearsal hall. Mm -hmm. And I took out the rest of the background and made prints on this p photographic paper that was half the thickness of normal paper. Mm -hmm. And then I hand painting it using Berg color toners mm -hmm. with a paintbrush. I must have made like 30 prints. Wow. Then I went around looking for backgrounds and I actually found it in a set shop catalog, an old set shop catalog. The samples, I found what I was looking for. I couldn't believe it. Mm -hmm. I ended up shooting those with a macro lens and putting it together. Nice. So during these these different book covers and so what this was during the what the the seventies <laughs> eighties this was is in the eighties I I was really good at making good looking people look bad <laughs> <laughs> this was for yeah me, uh, pharmaceutical yeah he looks a little under the weather there yeah. <laughs> so for pharmaceutical work too so you were you were like finding 
some, I mean, th th this type of work, book covers, uh, this advertising commercial type work actually pays the bills a lot better than your previous jobs. Uh, right, you right. Know, covering news and, and so on. Absolutely. So, so well, you, it's a whole nother genre of, of photography. Did you miss, you know, the document? Well, it looks like here. Well, the, yeah, I, I was applying for a grant the day that 9-11 hit. I couldn't leave and I had two wonderful little children and I, I had to wait to pick up my, my son and mm -hmm. I was, I couldn't go anywhere. So I was like making out an application for a grant mm -hmm. uh, for an exhibit, which I ended up getting. I went to deliver it, I was early. Mm -hmm. They were underneath the Brooklyn Bridge. Oh wow. I just walked up behind them. My heart was in my hand and I just took two or three shots. Wow. The next day, Giuliani gave a speech about New York being America and America's New York. And my concept, he gave me the concept for the mm -hmm. image. Mm -hmm. You were doing, as Julie Johnson here says, you were doing photo, like Photoshop type work before Photoshop was even even thought of. Like they were basing Photoshop <laughs> off of the techniques you were using in the darkroom, the actual well, analog version, it seems. Uh, no, no, not me in particular. I know. I'm, I'm just. I'm giving uh, you credit. That's a quite credit. a compliment. But <laughs> Thanks, Julie. For Jerry Yulman. Jerry Yulsman is the reason Photoshop is the way it is. Okay. I mean, he is a true inspiration. Yeah. That man's awesome. Oh, okay. All right. So now, now we kind of get we're moving to about the '90s, right? And you actually have this book here. Why don't you pull it up, uh, this book? This is a, a portfolio book? It's a portfolio. So th this is, uh, we're going to look says. through some of it. Um, here we go. So this is something that you would bring to clients in person and hand out, um, which has all sorts. We're going to go through. Um, we don't, yeah, only to cr uh, creative directors involved in uh, making commercials or directors at production companies. And you've got, producers. And, and this is, you know, goes back to, like you said, the 90s. You've got Gilbert Gottfried here. You, you said you've got a big story about this, but it's too long for, for the right. podcast and everything. This is an HBO assignment. This I was hired by the, by the production company. Uh, I was to do live action and also production. And this was a three-day shoot on Wall Street. It was cold out. Yeah. I, I, what I really like about looking through your portfolio of these production stills is, is the background, seeing the, the lights and the cameras and, and how things were, were shot back then. Well, this was tough. I was a non-union person on a union set, um, but I, I was put there by the directors or the client. Mm -hmm. uh, this is a uh, steady cam operator. Uh, Churchill, Ted Churchill, who was inc an incredible director, cameraman, and he's not with us anymore, but he was such uh, an inspiration to watch work. And correct me if I'm wrong, this was a Tide commercial? This was a Tide commercial was shot down in, Atlanta, uh, in uh, Savannah, Georgia. It was a uh, Metzner Bruce Mitchell production. It seems like a lot, you know, it's one of these things you don't I guess a person like me doesn't realize all these commercials that you see on television aren't are, are very high high production value. You know, it's like a, a movie uh, yeah. being filmed or something. It's Absolutely, not, it's not a. Uh, this is in Ireland uh, for Young and Can, Young and Ruby Can advertising uh, for Irish Spring Soap. And how did you get these types of jobs? Like, how how did you move into this this particular industry, which you seemed to do for about a decade? When I was teach, I was able to. I was lucky enough to be teach a class at Art Center College of Design, and Charlie Potts, the uh, told me that I should go into film, and I really didn't know how to break into film. And uh, my wife at the time in New York was repping Bernie Hershenson, who was a uh, a filmmaker in New York City, and he read me the riot act, what to do and what not to do. Mm -hmm. And I just followed Bernie's directions, and he gave me my first break. Mm -hmm. Here's a bunch more. I went through and pulled, uh, pulled this, some photos from. This is uh, uh, Charles Davidson, the creative director from Harry Viola Advertising. He designed all the commercials for Piaget, Concord Watch. And what's, and what's interesting about this is, is how you made these portraits that look like you're in a stadium. Yeah. But it's actually, as you can see in, in just pulling one of these out other the photos, longer lens. Pulling out the longer lens, but the background is just sort of a blur of a stadium. Yeah, I'm only doing stills. And quite frankly, I was the invisible man because I was in a union crew 
Santiago Suarez was is the director cameraman who's an incredible talent. Mm-hmm. And later on, he hired me to do uh, shoot an ad for him that appeared in backstage. Mm-hmm. Very cool. Um, <laughs> I see commercials. It's funny looking back at these. It's like this is this is back when I was a kid. So it's like I was probably the target market for these particular ads that you did. And these kids are probably all about my age now. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> this looks very familiar to me. Maybe to you too, Seth. The uh, the classroom settings. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, this was in uh, in is Jersey. Is this what's her face? Wow. Melissa yeah, Milano. Yeah, evidently it is. I've been I told was say, that. She looks you. very familiar. Yeah, that's funny. Wow. So this is where she got her big break, right? The high C commercial? Right. Now, when I'm shooting on this type of set, I'm I'm there, but I, I have to be invisible. Right. So yeah. I'm, well, how do I meter this? So are you, well. I use a, I, I used a one degree spot meter handheld. Really? I metered almost every shot that I went to take. I re-metered it before I shot it. And again, are you no shooting? Bracketing. Are you shooting through a blimp? Are you shooting like how not on sh- this? Not on these. Uh, one of the HBO shoots I was on, it was in a in a studio, so I had to use a blimp. But ah. rarely did I use a blimp. Yeah. Um, then you have clients like Diet Pepsi. Was this one right? Yeah. This was this was in uh, in Pittsburgh. Joe Montana and Dan Marino. Yeah, uh, someone online is asking about a blimp. They don't know what the blimp is. So a blimp is a, a blimp is a box in which a camera is housed in. It muffles the sound. So you, usually, I, I used a blimp. With, I had a motor drive on a camera, on a Nikon camera, and a motor drive makes a lot of noise, but the blimp uh, muffles it so the camera can't hear. The sound man won't hear the the click. Right. 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 Which is important because you're recording audio. But today, with digital cameras, you can shut the sound yeah, off. Yeah, now, nowadays it's not a not a big deal. But this is cool, like a, a young Dan Marino. And Diet Pepsi had one calorie. I didn't realize it. That's Zero Joe Montana. Now. Or excuse me, Joe Montana. What did I say, Dan Marino? He's there though. <laughs> They're all the same to me. All those quarterbacks. Um, yeah, and then storyboarding. So, so uh, we got this picture here of them storyboarding everything. This is another Ed Bianchi commercial. He was in the the previous commercial was Ed Bianchi's also. I was lucky enough to get to work for him. This is in a pool hall in Brooklyn. Yeah, if you can believe it. That's Young and Rubicon advertising. It the pool hall's not there anymore. It's not far from Brooklyn College on those. I think it's Nostrand Avenue. Uh huh. Um, it was an incredible day. Uh, and it was just and one it was a Gillette commercial, wasn't a it? A Gillette commercial. Yeah. See, I've done my research on your work now. I know I know all your different commercials that you've been doing. And what shooting were you sh- stills. What were you shooting on back then? You, you were shooting black and white film, right? Right, shooting black and white film with what camera? Yeah, what camera? I what used was your setup? Nikon. Just Nikons. a Nikon. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Well, I usually use three different Nikons with prime all prime lenses, no zooms. Uh huh. Today it's just the opposite. No primes, all zooms. Really? Yeah, because of the quality of the lens. It's just gone up, gone up so much. Through the roof. And you've and, and so you've shot. You were. It seems like you started out on Nikon's. Yeah. I started out on Nikon's and I moved to Leica. Oh my goodness. Yeah. And then uh, and then I moved back to after I was robbed and oh, one yeah. day lights gave me cameras to use for a while until they got robbed and. So then I went back to the story Nikon. of our lives. We just use what we use until they, someone robs us. Very cool. Um, I truly enjoyed doing this for a living. It was one of the most enjoyable. Oh, I, that picture is so funny. <laughs> this was for the photographer. I always wondered if that was a real mustache, you know? <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. Haynes Haynes commercials and everything. That looks so this nice. Lee Lacey day. Studio. <laughs> oh, oh, and this is pretty cool. It was a uh, Noxzema or something. Uh, these types of shoots are, are really highly produced, obviously. So Santiago Suarez, his his uh, production crew and production value was extremely high. He was over at uh, Ampersand Productions uh, in New York, on the West Side, and Work getting to on be on one of his sets was a, just a sheer pleasure. Very talented man. Uh, Julie uh, commented that your compositions are very powerful. Would you um, mind commenting on what you were thinking as you were shooting this type of work? Like, what's going through your mind? 
I'm following the action. I'm trying to, on, on this particular commercial, I was hired to shoot an ad for Santi for backstage. And quite frankly, I told Santi, just put me on the set. And let me shoot during the, through the entire production of the commercial and you'll pull the shot. And that's exactly what we did. I was, first of all, I'm fascinated by what's going on. I, I minored in filmmaking at Art Center College of Design. So I know what the crew's doing, and I'm trying to follow the live action and the crew at the same time, and the rest of it's my eye. Mm -hmm. I think that this shot's a very powerful, really cool shot. Was that the, 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 the image that they were making uh, yeah, for that, the video? Yeah, I would have liked to have seen the, the video angle exactly, because they actually had, if you go back a shot, it shows there's a periscope. There's a mirror at the bottom of the lens. It's like an upside-down periscope. The camera's uh -huh. upside down, and uh -huh. it's shooting across the surface of the water. Oh, so, so they're shooting into a and mirror. And they're shooting in color, so oh. the, the, it's a totally a different perspective. It'd be totally interesting to, to see the, the films contrasted against your black-and-white production frames, um, because I'm sure that <laughs> it'd be hard hard to find these these old uh, commercials these days although maybe you can find it on YouTube you can find anything on YouTube these days and then uh, yeah Santi Santiago Suarez hired me to document the making of this commercial it was shot at Silver Cup Studios oh yeah right across the and the uh, they actually built a jungle in the studio and they had a live uh, elephant uh -huh. for fruit and fiber fruit and fiber is that how they paid you in uh, boxes of, of cereal? cereal? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> this well. is Santiago Suarez. So, so basically you started and you made a name for yourself. You befriended these people and they, they liked your work and just kept bringing you back. Is right. That, is that basically That's basically the, what happened. It's a, which is a lot of, a lot of how we work. So, um, okay, cool. So let's, let's see here. Move on to um, that PowerPoint. Let's see if we can get that back up and going. Okay, so view slideshow there we go oh no i gotta I gotta buzz through them all so then then we get to another one of your books here which you have and you um sorry busting through here okay so you did a a, a shoot man in his barge explain right. to me what the scoop was for this and you've got the book here as well i should right. i should point out here the man in his barge was shot for my thesis um, I have a 2015 master's from the School of Visual Arts and Digital Photography, and I had to come up with a thesis. So for eight months, I ended up doing a documentary on uh, which I titled The Man and His Barge. And I'm just going to read this briefly. Okay, go ahead. It's uh, the, one, the Man and His Barge was shot in 2015, finished in 2015. The 101-year-old Lehigh Valley Barge is an historic landmark and working museum, and it's the last remaining example of Hudson River Railroad barges. This, is a, this photographic essay focuses on the maritime activities and maintenance performed by Captain David Sharps with the aid of his friends and volunteers aboard the Lehigh Valley Barge. The story highlights float repairs, spinning the barge, barge assessment regarding dry dock manned by the U.S. Coast Guard. So this, you, you spent eight months. Eight months. This was in the pouring rain. They were doing a float repair. They used the floats to do exterior repair work on the barge. This is after about an hour and a half out in the rain coming inside. That's Dick Captain David Sharps. And at this point, you're shooting digital now, right? This is all digital, shot with Nikon. Uh huh. Everything seems David's much smoother, explaining yeah. to his volunteers how to rotate the bar spin the barge now what's spinning the barge they have to rotate the barge 100 360 degrees okay mm -hmm. not 360 180 degrees <laughs> yeah, sorry yeah. about that because it, ha it rests up against the pier it's constantly pounding up against the pier and it's right. all done by hand this was shot f from above the fairway out in red hook looking down into the harbor oh yeah Seems this like a lot of maintenance they're and a lot of work to Well, do they're assessing uh, the, the damage to the barge and what they had to do. D David had to raise about close to $200,000 to have his barge go to dry dock. So, but this barge is also a museum. It's a museum. Okay. So, and, and where is it located? Is it located? It's located at the end. If you go down the end of Van Brunt Street uh, in Red Hook, uh -huh. 
and then turn right, head towards the Statue of Liberty, you'll run right into it. Gotcha. Very cool. So let's see here. What's next on your PowerPoint here? Sorry, switching back and forth. Um, so you did some conceptual illustrations. Let's see if I can just grab these and view slideshow. Sorry, doesn't work as well as uh, I had hoped. Nope, looks like I gotta blast through them all again. So, so talk about your conceptual um, illustrations, illustrations here. or conceptual portraiture, conceptual illustrations. Yeah. All right, this is a portrait of uh, Chris Lavish, and uh, it's in the studio. Uh, first, I would photograph Chris in the studio against a, wi uh, a white seamless with no light on it, so it would go gray. I would mask out the background. The background that you see behind him is a texture that I recreated from the original source and recolorized to play off the colorization of that's in his body. Mm -hmm. This is another portrait of Chris. The background was shot the next day as I was walking up Broadway. I ran in front of a church, walked in front of a church, and the lighting coming down through the sprinkling through the trees mm -hmm. was absolutely gorgeous and I just so I photographed the church doors so you so you shoot things and then sometimes just draw inspiration from what you see around you, you think oh this would be perfect for this and then you you go into Photoshop it's so very much like an this. interactive I interactive process interesting very cool the and, hardest and part also is I'm the noticing, masking I, I'm noticing you use uh, lighting you're you know more lighting in these than I guess yeah, in your previous work, which absolutely. was mostly documentary. Uh, this is my daughter. This was exhibited at uh, in a gallery this year uh, up in Vermont, mm -hmm. uh, celebrating women. Uh, the background's the same treatment. I was wondering, where did the profiles come from? Where did I get the idea from profiles? Now you have, um, I wanted to get to... It came from an art history book. Let's see here, the, the portraiture, you had a gallery color digital portraits right which kind of goes with what we were just talking about or is that something this is something different here well show me well this that is, one well there's a, there's a whole group here but okay so you also do a lot of self portraiture correct um, so we'll see this isn't the, the actual gallery that has a bunch of it but you do a lot of self portraits um, is that been something you've done throughout your career is that more of a, a newer well I uh, no I started doing it when I was at Art Center but that last image you showed uh, was shot. I, I operate the camera using my phone as a transmitter. Oh, really? And I okay. use the Sony Sony cameras. I'm looking at a wall of light, the six by seven foot Lastro light light modifier with two strobe heads in it. Mm -hmm. So it's literally a wall of light coming at me. In the mm -hmm. background, it's treated the same way. I mask everything out and I add the background later. Mm -hmm. uh, the series that I'm currently working on, which I've been working on for the last year, it's called Channeling Magritte. Let me where, find that one, yeah. Where I play Magritte. Please. Nice. You know? Here we go. Yeah. And uh, I was walking across 7th Avenue one day, and I just happened to look up the street at all the traffic, and I went, holy cow. I ran back, and I waited for the light to change again. I came back out with my Sony, and I started shooting the intersection looking up 7th Avenue. And then later I produced this image. And, and, th and so part of, well, obviously you're doing the... The background on this is a four-frame pano shot at sunrise out at the uh, Nature Center. And then I added myself. Now, I photographed myself in a studio. Again, I'm facing a six-by-seven-foot light modifier. It's a wall of light. Uh -huh. I have my phone in front of me in my hands. You can't uh -huh. see it. And I'm operating the camera through the phone. And then you're also doing this, the, uh, many of these portraits of you, uh, you're taking pictures of the scene that's in front of you. Um, the, the inspiration came from wanting to be, I felt like I'm, don't you feel like you're so much a part of one of your photographs when you make them? Sure. Because you made the photograph. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you feel, it's, you're attached to it. So I thought, well, why can't I put myself into my pictures? So I thought, well, okay, I, I think I can. Uh -huh. I was working on a, do on a documentary of a portfolio of imagery on graffiti called Soho Graffiti. And this scene lent itself. I was actually waiting for this young lady to walk through the scene so I could photograph the graffiti, but she looked at me and I went, oh my goodness, my finger, 
I didn't think my finger thought hit the trigger. So <laughs> I, it hit the trigger and I caught the shot. <laughs> and then later I, I made the, this image in, uh, I used Lightroom and Photoshop to do this. This is on a promenade in Brooklyn. I was going to a gallery exhibit and I was early and I'm glad I was early. So um, again, the, these portrait, you made these, these images obviously without you in them and then later, was it later or before you had all these pictures of you from behind and like, so for instance, are all of these portraits of your back taken at the same time after you've taken all these photos or? I usually, I usually will shoot the backgrounds first and then I post myself in the studio and I'll, I'll shoot sequences of images of myself in different angles to play off those images because I have the image in my mind's eye. Mm -hmm. I can't see it because I'm looking at a white six by seven foot light coming at me. Right. So I'm, I'm imagining what would be the right angle mm -hmm. to hold the phone at, just to So turn you're also hand. triggering it with the phone. And so I'm just, triggering it. So you're actually, obviously you've- That's what makes it believable. Right, because you're actually, <laughs> you're actually triggering it, but you're triggering the camera behind you yeah. and then supplementing this the photo. This was shot right. last year after Photoville. I was taking a break. I was gonna break. say, I saw these guys, like yeah, Photoville, Photoville, these guys um, <laughs> jet skiing out there. Yeah, that's, that's pretty cool. And, and this series, are you planning, what's your plan for this series? Is there anything that's been done with it yet? Are you going to plan well, an I, exhibit? I'm, I have an, I'm finishing up a new piece, which you showed. It's uh, Magritte uh, in Mykonos mm -hmm. was the last one I did. He's got a stone frame around him. I, w I was in Mykonos and I was looking for that one. I no. was looking for stone walls because, you know, Magritte was famous for making people look like they're made out of stone. Uh -huh. And I've, I've done one of him made out of stone and another one, two very other variations, three actually. Yeah, I saw one where you're in front, one where you're in back, and then one where there's like some sort of bars or something. Yeah, that was the American flag in Times Square. Yeah. Oh, oh okay, gotcha. Right. Lent itself perfectly. Right, right, right. Sure. Um, yeah, very cool. So What's that's a growing. It's I'm constantly working on that. What I, I think is really neat is the is the con sort of contrast of the natural light to the the lit nature of a studio portrait. Mm -hmm. um, kind of gives it this sort of. Oh, and then you actually bring in your old stories too. Clearly. Well, I was there, and it was really cold out. It looks that's like it was pretty cold. Can't forget that day. Oh man, cool. Um, so tell me about uh, SVA. You you decided. Oh, actually, let's back up a little bit. You were doing the, the production stills and, and so on, and then you decided to get into education, right? Well, through the Board of Education. Through the Board of Education. Yes, I, I have two wonderful children, and when my son, but my kids were really young, uh, I had to pay attention to my kids. And, mm. and not that I had to, I really wanted to, <laughs> and uh, to me, they were the most important thing. So in my life so I decided to I walked away from photography and I started designing educational programs for kids with special needs mm -hmm. and I went back to and I worked in Brownsville and South Brooklyn through the Brooklyn Arts Council and then I it was so successful that I decided well maybe I should become a teacher so I went back to college finished up a BA at Marymount Manhattan College and then went right into the fellow fellows program through the Brooklyn Brooklyn College mm -hmm. and full-time teacher in one of the schools I had actually had workshops in and then I taught until I turned 65 and I uh, as a uh, special education technology teacher I had an entire computer lab except I designed interactive multimedia classes on a smart board for kids because I wanted them to be totally interactive, which they are up here. So you would you would have them visualize their. I was reading this. You had them visualize their essays and sort of storyboard it. Is that is that? Well, they would do assignments like that in my computer classes, and uh -huh. uh, their homework assignments were on online. Uh -huh. So they had direct act access to them. Uh, when I left there, I took a year and, and to mellow out, and I decided to go back to school because I had to reinvent myself. I had to reinvent my brain because it was time for me to go into digital and I wanted wanted it so badly so I went to SVA to take their master's degree program with Katrine Eisman and Thomas Ash. And so this or excuse me what we're going to look at this trolley story so the, the man in the barge and the trolley story were both done as part of your SVA? No the no? man the trolley the 
trolley, uh, Brooklyn trolleys was actually shot in 19, from 1989 to 1990, and it's a black and white documentary of the building of the trolley line. It's behind the fine fair in, uh, at the end of Van Brunt Street in, in uh, Red Hook. Mm -hmm. I was the only person documenting, documenting it. I had received a grant from the Brooklyn Arts Council. I had exhibits, multiple exhibits in Red Hook, in a gallery and at the, the public library with these pictures and also a documentary later that involved the uh, Circus Sundays at the w Waterfront Museum. Mm -hmm. But these guys uh, literally, Jan, the fellow in this picture right here, uh, working on the trolley, the streamliner, he actually rebuilt the entire trolley. He stripped it down to nothing and, and redesigned the inside and outside. Mm -hmm. This is Bob Diamond. He's bending tracks. They actually used this device to bend tracks. I still haven't been able to fathom how they could bend that track, but that's the way they did it Gosh. by hand. Yeah, this was a two-year documentary. It took me two years to shoot it because it took, me, took them two years to build it. Uh -huh. And Greg O'Connell who owned the property actually was involved in all the heavy crane work and operation at the time. Well, there's no doubt that you you certainly stick with your projects. You know, this isn't sort of just a show up one day and, and no, you know, a day in I, the life of. This is, you know, many two years all year round going down there and keeping keeping track of what was going on. This was a trolley that was brought in from Europe. It, it was built in 1897, I believe. Mm -hmm. And I got to tell you, it was a joy to ride on. That's the old sugar factory that's now gone. Oh, in uh, in Red Hook. In There's Red Hook. They, they had a trolley barn, which they kept the trolleys in back then. Very cool. Nice. Okay, so um, that basically brings us pretty much up to date, right? I mean, right now, what are, what are we doing right now in in, in your right career? Right now, I've been I'm exhibiting. I'm designing images for. I'm um, continuing on channeling Magritte, that series. Oh, cool, yeah. I'm designing images uh, that I have on the computer I'm working on from Europe, the pictures I shot in May that I'm redesigning now. They're all digitally based, and, and they're composited image, images. Mm -hmm. Made to look like they're not composited images. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I'm, right now I'm in two exhibits, one in at the A. Smith Gallery in in Texas with Elizabeth Avedon as a curator uh, called it titled Interiors mm -hmm. for a shot that I, I, I did at the Vatican mm -hmm. uh, in May. And then um, I'm involved with the exhibit that's at the Four Freedoms at the Rivera Gallery in, in, uh, on Roosevelt Island. And so folks can see different types of your work uh, on your website here. Uh, go through. This is some portraiture again, but you've got actually a, a really nice display website. You, you're like, you can use my website. Normally people say that. I'm like, no, I want to show the full screen, but yours really <laughs> blow up to full screen, which is really nice. These are pretty high right. resolution. I images. put high resolution images on there. I don't, I don't put small res. I, I and, and your thought is that you want to teach? I would love to teach. Um, I, I, there t I have two passions, photography and teaching. And I really would love to teach photography, uh, but the facilities have to be there. I mean, I, I don't want to teach in a public school where they have no facilities at uh -huh. all. I would like to teach in a college. I would like to teach young adults uh, in a, on interactive, real-life applications of photography today. Mm -hmm. Very cool. Both in the studio and in the computer lab. And are you thinking that you want it to be based here in, in the city, or is it just sort of anywhere? Would you go anywhere for such a job? I would like for it to be in the city, but I'm open to going anywhere for it as long as it depends on the venue. Mm -hmm. Cool. Awesome. And then lastly, I, I guess maybe – oh, go ahead. What? I had a lot of fun shooting this, and I was inspired to do this by a lighting demo that was given at Adorama. No kidding. By Daniel. Really? Absolutely. All right. Daniel gave the lighting demo, and I went back to the studio, and I went, I know what I'm going to do. 
So, so for the record, th that there are lighting demos here in this space at Adorama, for, uh, for what it's worth. Uh, Daniel and Seth and, and others. Uh, get, and this is actually a studio space behind uh, behind us, and uh, you know you can come, you can check out their schedule. Adorama.com/events, I think, is where you can check those out. This is actually one photograph. If it was film, it'd be one sheet of film. It's one photograph. It's a digital f capture with multiple strobe lights that were turned on and turned off and fired. Oh, cool. So Chris is actually turning around and being re-photographed, re-photographing his other profile. Right on. I've, I've, done, I've done that with film before, but I've never done it through, through the digital, which is nice. Is it, is it such a way in digital now in the cameras where you can actually see the first image and then perfectly line things up, or do you kind of have to guesstimate it like you did no, with film? We, we, I taped off the floor. Oh, and I, I had the light low enough, just enough light so he could see where the tape marks were. Mm -hmm. So we, we practiced first. It, it, I No, I, I, literally the camera is mm -hmm. exposed to exposed the can. Right. Cool. Well, um, uh, oh, the question I was going to pose to you was uh, the master's degree at SVA. Um, obviously, you've, you chose to go through that process um, later in life, right? Uh, do you recommend people that are interested doing things like that at any time or earlier in their career? Uh, depends where your head's at and, and how much background you have. There's a lot of young people going through that program, but if you have experience in a digital realm or, or in the analog world, yeah. It's a wonderful transition. You're working only with the best working professionals in, in the industries. industry. For a uh, brief mention of Katrine Iceman, Thomas Ash, James Porto is absolutely incredible. Elizabeth Avedon, Ben Bobkoff, Carrie being one of the finest retouchers in, in the industry. Jack Wisnegi, which you could not live without, a wonderful photographer who knows everything there is to know about copyright. Mm, very important. Clifford Hausner. <laughs> Cliff we, Hausner. We know that fellow. <laughs> He's absolutely fabulous with lighting. Uh -huh. And Deborah Klimching, to just mention a few. Uh, you're working with some of the most talented people in the industry, and it's a, it's a tough program, but well worth it. Yeah, and they've got some great facilities. And One of the two of the best kept secrets, the I3 lectures, which are open to the public, and uh, the New York Photo Salon, which uh, the S SVA's master's degree department sponsors the location for them to meet at SVA. It's for open and free to the public, where, and you're exposed to a broad genre of photography. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and and just going to events like that or any kind of photographic events, you end up meeting people which could propel your life and career in different ways. Absolutely. Not that this podcast is that, but obviously we met at various events, and, and you never know where things are going to go. We're going to be working yeah. on a project. Let's open up a studio down the street. How about that? Great. <laughs> are you paying? <laughs> <laughs> it's a little expensive, I think, these right. days. Um, well, that's great. Um, is there anything that I'm missing that I that I forgot to chat with you about? I mean, I'm sure I've glossed over a little bit of your career, but wow, uh, I can't imagine yeah, right now. Can't imagine right now. Well, um, again, WilliamKingPhotography.com. You're on social media. You're on Instagram. Instagram. Um, you're very accessible, especially here in, in uh, New York City. So I, I hope that uh, we can. Uh, see you again at uh, many, many more events. Um, I thank you for coming. Thanks again to Adorama, the use of their event space, Tenba Bags, Canon Professional Services for all that you do to support us. Thanks to all of you who watched on YouTube and Facebook. Again, if you have any other questions, feel free to type them in the comments so that we can answer them after the, this goes offline. I'll have you go through and answer any questions that, that they might have. Great. Uh, William, thank you so much for coming. Thank you, Robert, and for I, having I'm me. I'm looking forward to seeing you again at these events. Take care, everybody. Cheers. Bye.